I'm Leah Lane, an award-winning travel writer and author of Places I Remember, Tales, Truths, Delights from 100 Countries. On this podcast, we share conversations with travelers about fascinating destinations and memorable experiences around the world. Travelers around the world stay in hotels and resorts, and those spaces can be a big part of what makes a trip special. I remember most of the lodgings with a strong sense of place, many of which have been readapted from buildings used in the past in a different way. There was Villa San Michele in the Italian town of Fiesole above Florence, Italy. It had been a convent, and we stayed where the nuns had slept and prayed. The facade around the entrance was by Michelangelo. And I remember a former warehouse along a canal in downtown Stockholm. It was spacious and modern, but the brick walls showed the wear of the centuries. In Jaipur, India, I stayed in a former palace. It was pink. In England, I slept in a room where a young Elizabeth, before she became Elizabeth I, had scratched a message with her ring onto a glass window, which still remained. I felt her presence. There have been rooms in former barns and even once a chicken coop. But whether they were luxury or basic, these lodgings told a story. Lodgings with a sense of place are the ones I most remember. Our guest is Tim Peck, chairman of the global architecture, master planning, and design powerhouse OBMI, synonymous with global luxury design and with a process rooted in storytelling. It has an extensive portfolio that focuses on luxury resort communities and hotels, and their projects evoke an authentic sense of place. Welcome, Tim, to Places I Remember. Thanks very much, Leah. How do you create or expose a destination which offers something really unique and something that becomes very transformative for, for the guests, something that, that offers that little bit special? I mean, we've all been through phases in our lives where sun, sand and everything else becomes very appealing life of relaxation. But nowadays, I think people are looking for so much more. They're looking for that, that experience which just adds some quality to their lives. So how can you, you layer that on, whether it's through the, the natural qualities of the destination or through what you can create. I mean, as designers, we create the stage set for kind of performances and the performances can be the nature, it can be the delivery of service, it can be delivery of wellness products. It's just an adventure. It is. That's why we love it. Yeah. Please share with us how you use storytelling and sense of place to create buildings for travelers and give us some examples. We use storytelling very early on in the design process and it becomes an essential part of the process for us. So that we're sitting down with all of the stakeholders, which will include the developers themselves. It will include hopefully representatives from the community and even possibly the guest target market. And we, we sit down and collectively create the story and the story must resonate with the context. So it's something that really works around and embellishes on the context. And, and this story gets woven into the whole design process and becomes a touch point at every stage of the design process. Can you give us um, an example? For example, okay, one of our interesting projects is the Royal Mansour in Marrakesh. That was a project which we designed for the King of Morocco. It started off as, as being a guest house for him and then actually has now become one of the very well-known uh, ultra luxury. Absolutely. It's a project. fantastic hotel, I will say. So, but that all started off as trying to create almost like an extension of Marrakesh, just on the outside of the walls of Marrakesh. With that, we walked through the guest experience as how can you translate the experience that you get in the souk, work it, weaving your way through the Riyads into something which can be translated into an ultra luxury experience. With that hotel, you end up with the, the alleyways that would take you between the Riyads become the guest corridors. The Riyads themselves become the guest suites, complete with their little internal courtyards. We have a whole circulation system that runs beneath the whole project, which is the, the service. So you, you will never see a service cart sitting in your corridor. They all invisibly service all of the riads and the apartments themselves. It all utilizes the traditional craftsmen. So there's phenomenal craftsmanship used throughout the project, which really exemplifies the feeling of Marrakesh. How do you create something that weaves the story of Marrakesh into an ultra-luxury experience? Sounds perfect. I have stayed in mm -hmm. riads and 
I think the idea of having a luxury hotel and the Riyadh experience is just about perfect. And you walk out into Marrakesh. Yeah, it that's all. right. Yeah. Tell us about Yuko Studio, which celebrates and draws inspiration from culture and heritage in your design for spaces. OBMI, it's been around for a few years, an 86-year-old company. And Yuko is our interior design studio based in Dallas. We had actually worked over the years on a variety of significant luxury projects. What are some of them? One of the more recent ones, I think, the St. Regis in Bermuda, which opened nine months ago, and the whole approach to storytelling and translated into the interiors. So it's making sure that the design is a fully integrated process from our point of view. And it reminds me of Frank Lloyd Wright with the organic outside and inside being a part of the beauty and the structure. It is very much part of it. And it's really trying to make sure when we're creating an experience, how can, how can we layer upon layer upon layer with that experience so that when we feel confident that the whole kind of internal experience is going to relate to what with the exterior shell or the stage set that we're creating on the outside. So you so- create new properties, but you also renovate And for example, I know some of your high-end designs are adapted palaces. Can you give us an example of that? We've had a fairly good run in Saudi Arabia, and we've actually been working over there now for, I guess, the past 10, 11 years, and developed some very good relationships over there. A couple of years ago, I was invited on the first press trip to Saudi Arabia. I refuse the invitation because of political reasons and their treatment of women. I know you've spent time there, so I'm very interested in your take on that. A fascinating place. I've been going there for, as I say, 10 years or so, and just seeing the transformations it's gone through. I mean, obviously, the cultural transformations are really quite fascinating. And when you look at it in the context of the history 40, 50 years, in terms of the transformation of the society, the transformation of the of the you know the very strong cultural biases that were there as an environment, parts of it are absolutely stunning. The stuff that we've been lucky enough to work with have been doing a lot of palace work in general, so which is a kind of an extension of hospitality. We actually worked with the boutique group developing an overall concept for refurbishing some of the existing palaces into ultra luxury hotels. So the the Alhambra Palace in Jeddah, which is the old palace for King Faisal. And it's been a wonderful experience redeveloping that into a product that'll service the the ultra-luxury market. So what Uh, do you do? Tell us how the palace, for example, how the rooms would be developed out of a palace. Like, I mean, first of all, you you have to understand what the the essence of the existing palace is. So you understand what drove the kind of the architectural ideas in the first place for the palace. So you can then work out how you can reinterpret that in a more contemporary way. How old is it? 1970s. A new palace. New in terms of how we look at things in certain parts of the world. And it went through a variety of evolutions of refurbishment. So there were some aspects of it, Andalusian, other aspects, which were the Hejazi architecture of the Jeddah region. Then you you get into the complexity of, of how you make it work operationally, how you can build into something which had a very specific palace function into something which you can put your hotel suites, your your wellness component, your restaurant facilities, you know. So it's it's an interesting juggling act. Obviously, you add to it and you play with the vocabulary through the process. It's fun. The ruins of Al Alua? Alula. Alula. I've yeah. read about that and seen pictures. That looks like Petra in Jordan. I mean, it has it, that same quality. It is Petra in, in many respects. It's in a spectacular natural context and undeveloped, you know. The sort of things that are being developed around that are, are amazing. There's there's incredible wadis that run close deserts, to deserts, yeah. Yeah, which are it's sort of the desert, but the almost the oasis within the right. desert, which has just a, a, a wonderful uh, experiential feeling in terms of the contrast of the desert and the landscape and the water and the mountains. Right. And then you go out to the Red Sea, which has the reefs, which are, will r- rival anything you see in the Maldives. It's just, just really quite spectacular. And then you go up into the mountains, completely contrasting, wonderfully unsophisticated environment. Up in the mountains, it's actually cold. Really? I, mean, I, I never thought I, of Saudi oh, Arabia. I, I was up in the mountains, just in, in Al-Baha, just south of, or quite a bit south of Jeddah. The mists came in and it was we were, we were actually driving through fog. <laughs> it was 
very very cold near neom up in the northern areas they're building a ski resort you know i heard it's a 500 billion dollar project eventually to develop neom i have been reading about that yeah it is yeah and we're lucky enough to be part of that looking at the some of the hospitality side of it so it's a really interesting country and obviously they're very ambitious in their targets there's still a lot to be done, but I think you just have to see it in the perspective of what has been achieved. It's uplifting to hear this, and I hope that the political situation improves and that we all can eventually go there because it sounds like a fantastic destination, and I would love to see it someday. Wellness has become a big draw for travelers, so tell us about some wellness trends and designs in hospitality and how you interpret that. Well, wellness now becomes much more than your health spa. It's it's very much a way of life. We look at how we can layer wellness on as as a complete program within the the operational program of any particular resort or hotel. And how do you deliver it in the actual hotel room itself? How can you build nature into the, the program? Well, I think um, if you tell stories, that oh, yeah. tells a story, right? O- automatically. It does. And then when you when you get into the spa itself, the spa has to be a really unique experience. It has to be something which which takes you into another world. It's not just going into your room, your little massage studio. First of all, you have to take people in into a dream and then translate that dream into an experience which which moves them mentally uh, and spiritually before you, then you can start to treat them physically. Yes. Music, candles and all that. But more than that. It's much more than that. Level, yeah. right. it's, it's much more than that. It's a really, it's a very interesting kind of sequential process that you take people through, where you you literally take them through a mental uh, almost downsizing. You, you layer them into this different world. It's a fun, fascinating. Right, process. it's fun, and you're vulnerable there. It's a very quiet, it vulnerable is. place. So you want to keep that it in is. mind. I'm sure it is, and, and that's what you have to explore that vulnerability and and allow the individuals to explore it through the. Process. Process. I remember being in a Turkish hammam in Istanbul and I was laying on a flat slab of marble and it was the water sloshing on me and it was just one of the most memorable things I've ever done but it was very simple but I felt the marble the coldness of it the warmth of the water and it was a, in a beautiful space it, that was original but I'm sure when you yeah. do these new properties you try to extend on that you know sometimes i mean i've, I've done the hammam experience in istanbul and and it is spectacular and, and one of the lovely things to feel is the part of history okay you you happen to be a tourist sitting there having the experience but you think how many people have been have done this before you yes and, and, uh, <laughs> you know so that it, it then it becomes woven into a totally different type of experience absolutely well, we'll talk about the future now. What do you feel is the future of hospitality design and some trends in tourism? It's a phenomenally broad subject because a lot of our travel has, you know, sustainability consequences with climate change. I mean, how many times do we get on an airplane nowadays to get to some of these destinations? And what is our carbon footprint? And unfortunately, a lot of these exotic locations are a little bit tough to get to. If we're talking about luxury travel, you know, we're all looking for something new and different. And that takes us somewhere which has probably leads a pretty dirty trail behind us. So that that's an interesting part of the process. And what some of the things that we've been looking at is how do you reinvent that experience? So one of the ones we're looking at is what is a very traditional kind of resort model, which and, and a resort model is a very horizontal experience generally. And how do we reinvent that to a model that could be in an urban context? So how do we take a horizontal experience and translate it into a vertical format, but still utilizing the the essential qualities of the resort. So how do you build the landscape into a vertical format? How do you build the kind of the districts that you would create through a resort into a vertical format um, so that we could reduce the need for travel and effectively build some of these resorts into an urban environment. So that's been a really interesting exercise that we've been working on. Other things we've been looking at, again, looking at some of these locations that we work in around the world are incredibly sensitive. We want to be able to put or to allow for a resort product that really literally leaves no footprint. So we've created a, a movable resort product. And it, this stems actually from some of the time I spent in the Serengeti and, and kind of dealing with the, the camps moving with the wildebeest uh, migration. Yes, I've done that. You move wherever they are. That's exactly right. You know, you have to keep this sense of luxury and, and 
everything that goes with it, we've designed a series of units and modules that will allow for the creation of a resort that, that could go into a national park on a seasonal basis. It could literally move with the seasons or it could be in a location for an event for a period. So it's the movable hotel concept. Is there one example of that besides in Africa? Well, the African example is the obvious one. I mean, obviously, we're, you know, when we're going back to, to Saudi Arabia, you've got the whole traditional Bedouin experience, you know, which, oh, yes. uh, which is the, the kind of the tented camp which would move across the deserts and the old yurts that, that you would get out in, in kind of Mongolia. So there are a variety of different ways that it has been interpreted in the past. So we're actually, we're currently building a prototype Interesting. How mm-hmm. soon do you think this will happen? We're hoping to have a prototype in place by the end of the year and then see if we can roll it out. Very interesting. Well, the name of the podcast is Places I Remember. So, Tim, I'd love to hear a bit about your personal travel experiences and maybe a story or two. I'm really, really lucky in the sense that because of the way the company has developed, we have been invited to explore some of the most wonderful locations across the globe, some phenomenally sensitive locations because of the way we weave our projects into the tapestry of, you know, context and community. So that has taken me on some some wonderful adventures. It all comes from really our roots in the Caribbean. And, and you know, I've lived in the, in the Caribbean region for I don't know, 40, too many years. And really, make, it makes you really understand the impact of development on communities. So you really feel and live it. So it's something which, you, which gives you a high level of sensitivity on, on issues. In Africa, we've been working on projects. We were, I was down in Mozambique in, in a, and looking at uh, three islands that we were master planning and some of the aspects of the mainland, which has had 17 kilometers of beautiful beach. I've been on that beach. I don't think that many people have, but it's a I very know. wonderful, unexplored territory there that you have. Well, to- and that's right. We went out. We went out to Vermezi. I don't know if you've been there, which is a, a, an island in no, northern Mozambique. You right. We arrived there and landed on this dirt airstrip in the middle of a little vi- little local village. And I was met at the end of the runway by a few of the local villagers. And obviously, we were in a little plane, you know, eight seater or whatever, ten seater. They met us at the end of the runway and, you know, picked up our suitcases and put them on their shoulder and kind of walked off into the sea. And oh, we, really? <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is a little bizarre. And then just tucked around the corner about 25, 30 yards offshore was a boat. And so we had to roll up our trousers, take up our shoes, roll up our trousers and walk off into the sea up to the boat. And that uh, it took us down the island to this beautiful luxury, very, very small, very boutique resort, which we were looking at to, to help them redevelop and things. So you had the reverse experience then where the people up next to the beach, you, the guys shoved the suitcase back on their shoulders, disappeared off up the beach and you rolled up your trousers and or they did offer to carry us, but I felt that. <laughs> well, you know, it seems to me. At a luxury place, especially, that would be one of the best things to do, to but keep it, that, to keep yeah. the part of going into the water. That and, was exactly right. Yes. You know, and, and to me, that was, how do, you, how do you create the essence of that experience, which was a really transformational kind of experience in terms of how you, you had a nice rum punch or whatever on the boat, but, but it, it was the, just the whole sequence, which said, God, I'm I'm so, somewhere totally different. I'm, exactly. You know, I'm, re- I'm living a different life. That sense of place. Me, this has taken me from the real world into another world, uh-huh. which is totally isolated. Well, thank you, Tim Peck. So interesting. You're <laughs> the CEO of Global Architecture, Master Planning and Design Powerhouse, OBMI, which is synonymous with Global Luxury Design. We've learned about the importance of storytelling and design, not only for pleasure, but to improve future travels and sustainability on our planet. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you very much, Leah. I appreciate the opportunity to chat and and explore adventures together. Thanks for listening to our award-winning podcast. We've recorded over 100 episodes of Places I Remember, so follow us on any podcast app. And new monthly episodes are also on YouTube with gorgeous video. My book, Places I Remember, is available in print and Kindle, and I read the audio version. Follow my travel writing at Forbes.com. Contact me at the links in the show notes or on my website, PlacesIRememberLealane.com, and keep making your own travel memories. <laughs>